Hey guys, this is Elsie Holt. This is my update for the week of September 24th. Uh, today I'm here with a very special guest. And I know you hear me say that every week. And every week it's true, but today it's especially true. Because the mask you see right behind me there was worn by this guy in a movie that we did together called You're Next. And this man is the fox mask himself, Mr. Lane Hughes. What's up, buddy? Hey, hey, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Um, so I'm going to get right into this. Uh, we first met, as my recollection is, at the Sidewalk Film Festival after a movie I did with Adam Wingard called Homesick. Is that what you remember? Uh, we met at Sidewalk? That's my answer to that. Yeah, we. Yeah. Uh, th this is my memory, and you okay. tell me if it's you anywhere. Go first. You go first. Okay, we'll trade. We'll trade first meeting memories. What I remember is us going to the Sidewalk Film Festival in Birmingham, Alabama, okay. with a movie that that Wenger did uh, called Homesick that I was in. Bill Mosley was in. Shepes, Tiffany Shepes, uh, Tom Tolls, and a bunch of other people. And after that screening, we were outside on the sidewalk in Birmingham, and Adam introduced me to you and said that you were a writer for a zine and that you guys had met and become friends very recently. Okay. Is that anywhere close to your recollection, Mr. Hughes? <laughs> um, no. You got a good memory, I'll see. You got a good memory. Uh, now, I mean, me and Adam did meet through, I was running a print zine called Breakfast in Denmark. My friend Andy, who ran the zine with me, he um, went to see a homesick screening at Sidewalk when he had just like the Fulci music and everything. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. And we wrote about Adam and our zine and interviewed him. And then I'm and I met Adam in Birmingham to interview him. And uh, from then we just like started, you know, he was doing Team Blood Jet, like all the shorts and everything. And then. Uh, we were doing Pop Skull was originally a short film, then it was an internet series, and then it became a well, nobody watches internet series, short films only go sh so far. We're going to do a full length feature. And I remember him asking me, you know, well, not so much asking, maybe telling um, who, you know, I'm thinking about getting Brandon Carroll, you know, that was in Homesick, uh, you know, LC. And I want to say that I remember the first time we met was at Wingard's house or somewhere like that. My memory shot. It's not as good as yours. Um, yeah, I remember meeting at a house. Um, in Eva when we shot all those, right? Nick Buckaloo's. That was yeah. Authority. Yeah. It was a little basement bedroom. Yeah. And um, I remember meeting, uh, seeing you there. Right. I could sw I could have sworn we met at Sidewalk. Um, I have, but I thought that the first like real interaction was the first time you really on it. For me, my memory is when we were shooting like the ghost stuff, you know, mm -hmm. and and everything uh, in the basement and Eva, and uh, then we did that whole backyard thing where you and EO cats were like the brothers, and that was shot at your place, wasn't it? It was shot at my grandmother's house. Yeah, that's right. And a lot of it was shot at my grandmother's house. Big ups to grandmas that let you do crazy shit. Hell yeah. Because I appeared uh, uh, partially nude in your grandmother's kitchen at one point in that in that movie. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's true. <laughs> that's true. Um, I was going to say, uh, Pop Skull was... Um, the first movie we did together. But this was a movie that was conceived by uh, you, I think, originally as a book. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I was really into, like, I had just started reading, like, Hunter S. Thompson. So I was, like, really into the idea of a gonzo journalism and, like, how to how you would do that as more of a personalized account, you know, mm -hmm. of what you maybe had went through, uh, mixing some fantasy and fiction and everything. And, Adam had, uh, you know, had a uh, 
not a recent breakup, but you know, he was in love with this chick that didn't want, you know, there was like a Romeo and Juliet kind of situation where the families didn't get along. And we were talking about breakups and of course we liked horror films and wanted to keep it in that genre. And we were kind of both uh, getting introduced to like psychedelics and drugs in general, but psychedelics particularly, particular in particular. And uh, he, uh, we just mix, mix mashed it all together, man, and dropped the book idea. And then it became the short, like I said, then became the online, uh, hey, we'll do like a, a, a soap opera kind of deal. You know, like every two weeks you get an episode. But, you know, our realization was, hey, do you watch those when people make them? Do you go online and check out every week's episode? The answer was no. So we're like, nobody's going to look at ours. <clears throat> so... We pocketed his dad's credit card and maxed that sucker out <laughs> at three grand, you know, but yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that, the budget, right? That's what it goes on record as being three grand. Yeah. I remember it being uh, publicized after the fact as, as three grand. And I, I remember the first time um, I heard of Pop Skull. I was Adam called me because we had already done a couple of shorts. He and I between right. homesick and and uh, pop skull. And he called me and he said, well, what's your hair look like? And I said, what do you mean? Always, and he's, it's always a concern, isn't it? What's your hair look like? Right. Yeah. And he says, well, I, would you grow your hair long? And I said, well, sure. Why not? And he said, well, great, because I want you to play this uh, evil redneck ghost. And I was like, OK, great. And I said, you send me the script? And he was like, no, there's not one. <laughs> right. Yeah, we, yeah that's it. we didn't do it with script. We just had bullet points like, uh, here's the scene, scene one. Here's uh, A and here's Z. It's up to you guys to get to Z. Here's the A, you know, and, and we would just like, rehearse you know what i mean just mm -hmm. like i mean pretty much everything was improvised on the spot we knew what was going to happen where it started where it ended but we needed we just kind of let the actors and the director and everybody work as a group to figure out what was going to be said what the movements were everything like that yeah and i i recall too uh you guys you and adam and el cats all kind of worked on the script because i remember a, El sending me Evan, as I call him, sending me um, a couple, of, a, at least a scene where my character and his character were driving, and we killed a guy on the roadside. I remember reading that; it was a scripted scene, like you know, a, well, it's a normal script. But we never Adam, did that scene when when we started. Evan wasn't involved, and then Adam was like, "I'm going to bring in Evan." You know, how you feel about that? And I thought, well, great, because you know he produced and wrote Homesick. You know, and a lot of those shorts. You were in at the time with the whole team budget thing. Evan was writing from LA and sending. And uh, Evan liked the idea of it being kind of uh, more free form, but at the same time, I think he couldn't stand it. You know, he's very, he's very much a writer's writer, just like Simon Barrett. You know, everything's very structural. And a lot of the, if there was anything pre planned dialogue wise, it was probably from Evan. You know what I mean? Like it, uh, he wrote, I mean, there was so much written and dropped for that movie. It's ridiculous. I mean, Adam Wingard had a Ziploc bag full of 90 DV tapes. Mm -hmm. I mean, we shot stuff that was edited. There's at least, I mean, you have an alternate edit of the movie, right? Yeah, um, I have a different version than what was on DVD. There's a pretty cool 20 minute long uh, alternate way the movie starts that me and Adam would like to see on a DVD as an extra, like the way it could have went, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it was kind of like a choose your adventure, uh, you know, book. Uh, That's awesome. I mean, we should uh, put it out like that. Edit your own version of pop skull. Yeah. Wouldn't that be awesome if you could do a DVD awesome. where you could make, you could make several yeah. different combinations of the same movie. No one's done that before. Yeah, it'd be neat, but uh, I don't think Adam probably would appreciate me being like, yeah, we didn't know what the fuck we were doing. We had to go through 90. I mean, we show, I remember our first screening of that 20 minutes, everybody said, oh, it looks good. That's the killer on any project when they're like, eh, it looks good. 
you yeah. know? So we just kept filming and filming and filming and editing and editing. And it's, I remember see Adam showing me some stuff when I was over there filming on one of the several filming excursions that happened over right. the course of a year. And uh, one of the things he showed me was a half for me and him. Do what now? Two and a half for me and him. Years of filming. Oh yeah, oh god, I imagine so. Yeah, for me, I don't think it was that long. It could have been, but I don't really remember. Oh, I'm sure you would get a random phone call six months later and be like, "Hey, you remember that scene we shot? Do you mind driving two hours and doing a pickup?" You know? Yeah. 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 I I, more, I remember too. Um, like I said, he was showing me scenes that I've never seen since. Like there was a scene in a diner, a long scene in a diner. Wow. wow. Yeah. Um, there was, he, he showed, there's a film within the film and he showed me that film in its entirety and it's fucking hilarious. Uh, that's all, all of this. I, I had forgotten about a lot of it. The diner, uh, sequence where it's like me and Brandon Carroll hanging out and stuff, I think. And I'm acting all sad, of course. Uh, I don't remember the movie. Yes. The Jeff Dylan Graham. Yeah. Movie inside a movie, the vampire movie. Yeah. Yeah. And Evan directed it, and Adam starred in it, and it felt it ended with him with Adam just like <laughs> yes. stabbing the guy with um yeah. stabbing Jeff with yeah, a stake. Yeah, all about that. Yeah, and then at the end he screams to the heavens, "Chrono!" Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it freeze framed. You know, it was so fucking hilarious. I'd yeah. like to see that as an extra because I know it exists in its entirety. Because I've actually sat and watched. I mean, it's like twenty minutes. It's not like a full length movie, but right. well, it's like we, the last act of a movie. I I spoke to Wingard on the phone a few months ago and he I asked him about the state of pop skull because our distributor, you know, was like a small DIY kind of company. And, um, I forgot how long our contract obligation was for them to, you know, retain the rights and everything. But, uh, apparently they're still in business, but not quite like they were. So the rights went back to us recently, like in the past year, so we'll uh we're looking for a new distributor if anybody wants to help us out on that and put out a you know and we would like to try to get it into festivals again to like put more attention since adam's doing so well and your next has the following that it does you know uh, we wouldn't be up for any like accolades or awards or anything but you know some screenings a new distro you know all that didn't you go to, to Berlin or Germany with Pop Skull Film Festival? Rome, Italy. Yeah. Rome, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. How did this go? So Adam was on a reality show. I remember that. On the, on the lot, Spielberg's on the lot, short-lived filmmaker reality show. He was on there. He hated it. Mm -hmm. um, he uh, purposely got kicked off by giving a lot. They had to give like a log line. And, um, you know, he came up with some ridiculous mutated dog that, you know, destroys the city or some shit. Um, and uh, we I'm were sure, getting, I'm we're, sure Carrie we're, Fisher loved that one. Oh, yeah. We were getting rejected like all the time, though, during this. You know, we would talk maybe he was allowed like one phone call to a friend and one phone call to a family like he was in prison because he's on like a reality show. So they keep everybody separated and everything. Uh, the cast as well as outside of, of the show. And I mean, we were getting rejection letters left and right from Sundance, uh, Fantasia, you know, all these, you know, key festivals we wanted to get into. And he got booted off that show. We didn't know what we were going to do because no one wanted to show the movie. And we got a email or, you know, whatever. And it was from Rome, Italy not Rome, Georgia, like you would expect living in Alabama, you know, and, uh, my first plane trip ever was actually like a 20 hour give or take flight to Rome, Italy. And um, yeah. And we went there, we screened it, we came back and we went to AFI in Los Angeles. And then we played sidewalk and we didn't win best Alabama film, which I'm still a little salty about. I mean, how? Yeah. yeah, that I didn't, I don't remember that. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, hmm. you know, we played a few more, but, 
AFI and the Rome thing really set it off. I think AFI accepted us because we got into the Rome Film Festival and they were like, well, we can't look like chumps. You know, we got to jump on board. We got an apology letter, not an email, an actual written letter from Sundance Board apologizing for not picking it up. Sons of bitches. Sons of bitches. But who gets an apology letter from Sundance? This guy. These guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the funny thing about the sidewalk thing, it was probably the film that won best Alabama film was probably like, um, you know, lost in the cotton fields or something. I mean, <laughs> that's what I was about to say. Yeah. It's like some driving Miss Daisy, like real Southern, you know, uh, shit. But, uh, I whittled on my porch. You're right. The, the Hunter brothers actually, Alan Hunter helped, you know, he was like a producer on pop skull, you know, and I remember. Yeah. Yeah. I remember a screening that we had of Pop Skull uh, at his theater, right? The, work, the workplace theater. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one reason why I was so salty about the whole sidewalk thing is because we were essentially from Birmingham. We were, you know, in bed, so to speak, with Alan Hunter and the Hunter brothers. They own workplay, and by all rights, they didn't control sidewalk but they had a pretty good end to it and we were poorly promoted and we we weren't promoted at all and then we were like had a really crappy time slot like at like 10 o'clock against two other like big movies on a saturday night you know and we're like shoved in a school art center with like a pull down screen you know and all you know we're not in the alabama theater you know but i mean i'm over it i'm over it it's cool that was 10 years ago i'm over it and see, now my memory's failing because I'm sure I was there because I went oh. to all the screenings. But oh, yeah, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, and Brandon Carroll, and well, yeah. um, yeah, he, was, he was there, yeah. Oh, and uh, well, now we're skipping forward. Never mind, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I was thinking about that the other day, though, Pop Skull, because I was thinking about the screening that we had at the workplace where, um, because it was a, a movie that I had made that no one wanted to watch or show that's never been seen by anybody. But there's a shot in that movie that was actually, I remember Adam telling me there's, there's something in there that when you see the movie, I hope you're going to like it. And I said, okay. And so I went to the, to the screening and there's actually in the cut, that cut, there was a shot from a movie I did called the weekend that was in pop skull. And there was a shot of you. Okay. And, uh, I was, and he turned, I remember in the middle of the screening, he turned and looked at me like, so do you like that? Right. I was just like, sure. I think that's awesome. <laughs> that uh, that weekend film mm -hmm. you did, I remember going and filming that, like at you and your girl's place at the time. Were yeah, a friend, a friend of yours. Yeah, or um, and it was like a Cassavetti style kind of, you know. Yeah, it was uh, kind of, sort of like Pop Skull, improv from uh, an outline. Uh, right. I mean, you know, we both know uh, at least one person who's made very good money from from making movies with less of an outline than we had. So, um, but yeah, yeah. But we won't talk about the weekend because no one's ever seen it. They won't know what we're talking about. Yeah. All right. Well, no one's ever seen Pop Skull either, but it's okay. But the possibility <laughs> of Pop Skull coming out is uh, pretty distinct, especially now. Oh, yeah. I'd like to see it get a, a new life or whatever. I mean, I saw where I don't even have a copy of it. Uh, you don't have a copy of Pop Skull? No, not anymore. Like an official printed up copy? No. Um, oh, okay. Because I've never had I never had an actual I, well, I don't have a I don't have a DVD or anything anymore. I, uh, I saw on eBay where at one point they were going opened unsigned copies for like $100. Yeah, somebody was telling me they were looking for a copy of that because amazingly, a lot of people talk to me about Pop Skull wanting to find it. And uh, I'm more often than not here. I want to see it. I heard about it. I want to see it. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah, because uh, when it came out, critics actually really liked the movie. I remember. Uh, I remember reading really good things about it. Um, which kind of got got me excited because I was like. You know, because Homesick was one of those things where people thought when we were filming it, oh, this is going to be like a cool, quirky cult classic. And it came out through Synapse Films. And I mean, it was all right, but it's not really a known movie. So after when yeah. we got all the uh, critical notice from Pop Skull, and of course, some people didn't like it. Some people are always not going to like it. But, a lot, but for a horror film made for $3,000, Pop Skull really had some good buzz going behind it. 
Yeah. Well, I think what helped is we had like the 70s. Uh, well, not really. Uh, I mean, it's probably only obvious to like me and Adam or people that worked on it. But like, you know, uh, Dennis Hopper kind of, you know, mm -hmm. wave of filmmaking and everything uh, the, with the psychedelics. And then we had, uh, you know, we had the drama, crybaby, you know, emo element, you know, they, it, it wasn't like just straight ahead gore and nudity and, you know, what you find and like homesick, you know, but homesick to me is an easier uh, sell. You know what I mean? That's one thing I think, though, that kind of throws people off about Pop Skull and it did with uh, festivals that rejected us and uh, distribution companies that even liked it. They would say, oh, well, we really liked it. We just don't know what to do with it because it doesn't really fit into a specific genre. So how do you sell it? But it would always boggle me and Adam because it's like, well, you sell it like as, as that, you know, like uh, you make your own, you know, niche for, you know, instead of trying to find one. Yeah. And it was, I remember that movie being something that I was really proud of too when I saw it. I thought, you know, if they could find that niche, then it could really take off. But who knows that these things are going to happen with the distributor and all that stuff. But That was my first time ever acting. Was it really? Yes, ever. I think we've talked about this. Well, well what did you think of acting with uh, some of these people that have been doing it longer? Um, was it intimidating? Did you just fall oh, right into it? What? Yeah, I mean... Uh, I, I mean, I dropped out of my, I was in, uh, and like an extracurricular drama class with the high school I went to didn't offer, uh, like an official arts program, but they had one after school. And at my senior year, I joined a play and I had three lines. It was, Hey, you, well, maybe two really, Hey, you give me that purse. I was a mugger. Go figure. And I dropped out because I was just too nervous to get in front of, you know, 50 people or less, you know. And oh, so uh, you never made it past rehearsals? No. And I didn't leave them hanging or anything. I mean, I was like, I'm just not going to be able to do it. But uh, I had an interest in maybe acting, but I didn't cast myself as myself, like as Daniel Cowan in Pop School. I didn't ever intend for me to necessarily be the lead. One day, Adam was just like, hey, you want to play the lead character? And I was like, uh, sure. And uh, I had like a crash course uh, actor thing with like me and EL and Adam and Daryl Murpaw. Um, like, uh, you know, just in a living room and I would go in one room and they would come up with a scenario and I would come out and we would kind of have to just play off each other, you know, and then meeting you and Brandon Carroll, you know, try to pick up on stuff because you guys have been doing it since high school. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, both of you guys have been in school theater, you know, and then you yeah. did theater in college, right? I did. Yeah. That's what my degree's in. Okay. See, <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, the, the parallels, you know, uh, aren't there as far as like, I mean, I, I still get pretty, I don't consider myself an actor whatsoever, but, uh, you know, I still get pretty nervous, uh, filming or going, you know, acting against, uh, well, against may not be the correct word, but, uh, you know, with, uh, people that are more skilled or been doing it longer, you know, I mean, it, it, it is intimidating for me. Yeah. Well, that's understandable um, because I think everybody, no matter how long you do it, there's a certain sense of of nerves when you're on, you know, a set or on a stage. I know that, like the first thing I ever auditioned for, and I've talked about this in a couple of interviews before, was actually Forrest Gump. Right. And uh, I was 12 years old at the time. They were looking for an eight year old, so I kind of got ingratiated into it pretty early. Right. And then I, I'd done a couple of bit things as a teenager, like I was in this Michael Mann movie called The Insider and uh, a thing called The Grass Harp. But, uh, but really, it wasn't until I started doing theater in college that I became, that I started doing kind of professional theater. And then from there, obviously, this, <clears throat> the whole film thing came about. Um, you prefer film or theater? I prefer 
Yeah, that's a good question. I prefer film because it was my first love, I guess. Okay. There are, are great things about theater. I haven't done theater since I've become a film actor, to be honest with you, and that's probably because of the preference that I just told you about. But right. there are um, good things about being a theater actor in rehearsals, about you know building a character and easing into it and playing with it for a while and then by the time you're on stage you've kind of perfected this thing and that's a difficult in films because you kind of have to per perfect it from take one yeah and uh, um well with theater you get to, a lot of times you what go on in professional theater like you'll have like five shows in seven days or uh, two a day right yeah so you're able to be like it's more like an athlete to me, you know, like, well, I, you know, missed that jumper, you know, jump shot. I'm going to do better. But you instantly get a chance to relive that moment with film. You can sit down and watch it yourself and be like, man, I should have done that differently. Oh, well, you know, yeah. like there's no yeah. other chance, you know. And that's sort of the fun thing, too, about theater is that if you don't feel like you nailed it one night, you have another chance and then you can do something different. And even if you did feel like you nailed it, you can always try new things with different performances, not changing the words or anything. But, you know, doing this or doing that, it makes it fresh and not boring. With right. movies, like you say, it's pretty much cemented on screen. The the And you do a multiple amount of takes and you don't know which take is going to wind up in the movie. Right. So you're in kind of the hands of the editor, which thankfully Adam has edited most of his own movie. So I, I don't worry about that so much. No, me either. I've never worried about, you know, Adam told me one time I was, I was half serious, half joking. And I was like, don't make me look bad. And he was like, Oh, if I make you look bad, I look bad. You know? Right. So I that's right about it. Well, let's go from there. Let's segue over into your next, you guys mm -hmm. had done, uh, you guys had already done uh, a movie called VHS in a town up near where Simon grew up. And before that, we did A Horrible Way to Die there. That's right. Yeah. But we're not going to talk about that because I'm not in it. Okay. I understand. I understand. But no, but but yeah, I think that I found out that you guys were shooting. I knew you were shooting A Horrible Way to Die, and I was fucking pissed. No, I'd kidding. have been too. I'd have been pissed off too. Yeah. No, I was sort of joking. But I, I, it's okay. It's just us. <laughs> it's just us talking here. It's just. <laughs> Um, but then after that, I knew you guys were doing VHS and I didn't know what that was. And it was kind of explained to me a little bit, but I wasn't still sure. And so I went up there, you know, I got called and offered the part in your next. So I went to Missouri and when I was in Missouri, Adam showed me a, a DVD of the wraparound section that he had directed in VHS. And I was like, oh, so that's what you guys were doing. That's kind of cool. Right. Um, and so and then I started, uh, you know, we started working on your next. What was your experience like of getting into uh, getting uh, offered your next? Well, Did he I just call you or what? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he just uh, he said that he. How did I feel about playing a mask? You know, person for the most part. You know, I guess is like uh, trying to be respectful because you know most you know actors don't want to play a mask villain or killer you know and i was fine with it because the original hell carpenter's halloween is my favorite probably horror film and one of my favorite films of all time and i just thought i thought i, I agreed instantly but uh you know uh we're jumping ahead a little bit and we'll get there but talking about like uh culture shock man you gotta think like uh that set was the biggest set I had been on, you know what I mean? And it was just like overwhelming to me, like on a few of the occasions, you know what I mean? Like having that many crew members and that many people, I wasn't used to it, you know? Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. yeah, he just asked me if I, how did I feel about playing a, a mass killer? And I thought that that shit was awesome. I mean, really? Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of had a similar reaction. Um, I remember flying up there and, getting my head cast uh, in mm. plaster by Mike Strain, who's great, the great uh, effects guy who worked on that. Uh, there were a great, there was a great team actually of effects oh, yeah. guy, guys, but Mike Strain uh, was probably, is probably still the best effects guy I've ever known or worked with. And um, so that was my first experience with your next. And then I don't think we saw each other on set until 
we were shooting the movie though. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, well, we lived together for like six weeks in that motel room. That's right. We lived there with everybody else in that uh, motel yeah. building. Yeah. It was uh, Nick Tucci was next door. Sharni was around the corner. And yeah. It was like camp. You're next. Yes. Um, we weren't on set together that much, though, were we? Like we, at, the, at the same time. We were kind of around, but we were very rarely in front of the camera at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I remember a lot of times it would be like, uh, we need you at two o'clock. And uh, then it, you get a call and they're like, no, nope, five. And then you'd be like, all right, well, I'm going to go get something to eat. And then it'd be like, hey, we need you at 3.30. And it's like, ah. Yeah. And then there'd be like seven days in a row where they don't need you at all. And you're like, what am I going to do for seven days, man? You know, that. but I mean, I'm not complaining. It was a cool experience. I mean, all around. Do you remember what the first scene in your next that you shot was? First scene. Because I do. I remember my first scene in that movie. Let me go through. No, I don't remember my first scene, but I remember, do you know, you know the part where Sharni hides behind the curtain? Yeah. And then she like throat chops me. I think I know where this story's going. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, you know, doing my best professional wrestler and selling the motion, you know, and for those that don't know, when you're the person being hit, it's up to you to make the person doing the striking look good. Yeah, and I had your compound bow, right, or uh, crossbow, on my back, and I had you know my machete on my back and everything. She throat chops me, and I do a great sell, so good that I fall back on all this stuff pretty hard onto a hardwood floor, and that's that. I don't remember my first scene, but I remember that one, and I remember going to the emergency room for sure. Yeah, I remember you were pretty seriously injured. Actually. Well, I had a previous injury about a year or so before that, that, well, man, a wheelchair and homebound and things like that. And it, it kind of uh, aggravated that injury pretty good. And, uh, yeah, so the rest of the – and then I remember having to tell the producers and – you know, they were like, of course, as producers and financial backers and everything, they were like, oh, no, are you okay? And it's like, yeah, I'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. So for the rest of your next, I was kind of like having to be sedated and on antibiotics and all this stuff, man. They had to give me like four medications and, you know, but I, I toughed it out. And I think that, after that was the scene where um, Adam, Adam beat you in the head. Oh. Yeah, I had a lot of good. You're bringing back a lot of traumatic stuff. Um, yeah, at the very end where Sharni's character hits me with the log, uh, Adam wanted to get a, you know, close up of the 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 hitting, and um, Sharni was afraid to do it really, you know, because Adam Adam's the type of guy that like you know he's not gonna like let somebody else hit you in the face. It's like if you want to hit him in the face, here's your chance, you know, and she. It was just like very like, you know, because I had to have the mask on and it had to show impact. And Adam was like, let me see that thing, you know. And he got and he was like, he lifted up my mask. I'm laying on my back on the concrete. And he's like, Hughes, I owe you one. And he puts down my mask and he's like, bop, bop. <laughs> I mean, and I couldn't move. I couldn't make a sound. I just had to just. And the mask is like hitting with the, you know every uh, strike or whatever, but uh, yeah, good times, man. Good times. That was the last thing I filmed too. That was my last shot. Mm, yeah. See, that was the thing about my relationship with Wingard is slightly different from yours because he likes to abuse you. Well, yeah. I mean, we we lived together for quite a while, so it was, you know, we he he had to pull the friend card a few times within a working relationship, you know. Yeah, like, it'll be all right, buddy. It'll be fine. <laughs> well, the first scene I remember shooting in your next, it, I remember it vividly. It's the scene after I find Simon dead in the foyer, and I walk into the to the oh, um, flip the table. That was awesome. You did an awesome job. I wasn't there for that though. I wish I would have been. Yeah, that that actually wasn't the first scene. That right after that in the movie though, we shot. We started with me coming into the foyer. 
Okay. And I have my hand. I remember Adam talking about, you know, I had my hand on the back of my head and I was rubbing it. And uh, he's talking about how he wanted my fingers to look like they were digging into my skull. I remember that. And then I slammed down the, um, the axe and then I throw a lamp off a table and that's when I hear her. And then I chop through the door. That was the first scene that, that how I was shot. that. How was that for you? Like, were you nervous? I mean, nerves, of course, but I mean, were you, you know, did you feel prepared? Did you, you know what I mean? Surprisingly with that movie, I felt really calm the whole time. I think maybe it was because I'd taken such a long break before because I'd had a real bad experience on like the previous film I did. Okay. And so I was kind of not really looking to act again. And Adam got me back into it by offering me your next. Right. And so when I was on that movie, I just had like a nice feeling of, I've never had it before since on a movie. I really understood the character right. uh, completely. And I just was very, very relaxed. Um, now, I do remember when I was chopping through the door, there was a weird story about that because everything in that house was historic. We couldn't gouge anything. We couldn't mess up anything, leave any footprints. Right. And I know they had to take out the original door to the basement. And, and they put a fake door in there with fake panels that when I hit it with an ax, the panels in the sides of the door, you know, were just supposed to easily be cut through like balsam wood. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you were on the set to see this, but every time I would hit the panel with the ax, the whole panel would pop out of the door. So it wasn't right. like I was chopping through the door. It was just like the panel right. popped. Right. Yeah. And no matter what they did, they could they put screws in it. They started to brace it with pieces of wood on the back. And every time I'd hit this thing, the whole panel would just fall out. And it's one of those things on a movie where you go, "This should be so easy," but it's taking right. hours. It's you a know? fucking door, man. Yeah. Um, did they? Did you get to chop through a real one, or did you? I mean, uh, no, no, they didn't put the real door in there. They finally managed to secure the panel enough to where I could get maybe two or three chops before the whole thing got shredded. And right. it was really made of nothing, that little panel I was chopping through. So they kind of edited it to look like I hit the door a lot more than I really did. Okay, uh, yeah, cause I mean, yeah, that's what it looks like, you know, you're, you know, Jack Nicholson from The Shining, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. And it, I think that was, you know, but it's just one of those things. Cause I remember people were getting really kind of pissed and irritable and time was going by and we, money was going to spend. similar spend. thing when I was, uh, who did who did my character catch in the hallway and do the throat slit? Rob, you caught Rob yeah. Moran. Yeah, yeah. Um, we could not get. We had a machete that they looked more like a sickle because it was cut out in the middle, so it would fit. You know, like a mm -hmm. you know, like you know, so it looked like it was going through, and it was supposed to make give the effect of going across his neck. But uh, for whatever reason they could not get this to work. And at first, you know, I did a few takes and it wasn't working. I felt like it was me, you know, and I was like, well, you know, whoever, you know, wants to give it a shot. And I mean, we probably spent quite a few hours getting that like, you know, blood and, the, you know, cause Adam kept saying that he could see, you know, the, the prop element of it and the everything. And, I know that took a while. So we both had an experience with, with props on that movie. You weren't there for, for mine either, but uh, yeah, they were getting really irritated because it was such a simple gag. You know, it's like, you would put this on your neck and you just do like that and the blood, you know, and it was not happening at all. Yeah. Um, I, I, I want to know about your table flipping. That was an awesome scene. Yeah. The table flipping was, um, Oh God, there's a story behind that too. Uh, that we shot that scene that was kind of more in the middle of the shoot for me um, because this, the table was already there Simon is on the floor and it was the real Simon down there with blood on his head most of the time you see it it's a dummy Simon but that was a real Simon which I was I appreciated him doing that because when I was reacting to a body and grabbing him and stuff it was really him so I wasn't trying to pretend it was a you know a right, yeah. dummy. <laughs> you had something to play off of but there was a guy on the set of that movie, and I won't mention his name, but he was a stunt person, and he was desperate to get in my wardrobe. And I know that sounds sexual, but I don't mean it that way. <laughs> was, he, was he the guy that like showed us how to use our weapons and stuff? Is that who you're talking about? I don't remember his name, but is that who you're referring to? 
That's the one. All right. I know who you're talking about. And uh, he wanted to get in that mask of mine so damn bad. And he kept telling people, you know, this guy is not going to be able to flip that heavy table. Now, he, right. would never, he would never say it to me personally. But it got, you know, it's a fucking film set. It's like, yeah. yeah, yeah, gossip, gossip, yeah. Uh, you know how it is. It's like in high school. It's like an adult um, high school. You, you're a sure. little closed off group of people and everybody gossips and stuff. And so you know what's going on. So anyway, it got back to around to me that for the, like the past couple of days, this guy's been talking about wanting to do the table flip. What a pussy LC is. And he's not going to be able to flip that table. Yeah, exactly. And this pissed me off to such a degree. Uh, because I was now listen, there are scene, there are things that happen sometimes in a movie stunts that I will say no fucking way I'm doing that. But if it's something I'm capable of doing, then I'm more than willing. And in fact, I insist on doing it. For yeah, instance, I'm the same way. Shardy went out the window. Obviously, yeah. I would. Well, her, her, her Shardy's character jumps out a window. Right. And a, a, a great stunt woman named Renee Moneymaker did that. Now, if they asked me to jump out of a second story window into an airbag, I would say, dude, get my costume and have at it. Yeah, I would try it. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, I would like to think I would do it. Yeah. You would do it? Because I'm saying I wouldn't. Like, I, wouldn't I would do, do it. it. But, I mean, the, the issue with that, too, was because Sharni was a dancer and pretty athletic. Well, you have the, the whole insurance thing right you know and being the star of a film for her in her case but also um it was the size of the window right i mean mm -hmm. that lady had to jump through i mean it's not like they cut out a fake wall and was like no it's gonna look like a window i mean this lady really had to run you know and jump through a tiny window right because these uh, windows are built to be uh, functional in a house they're not really built for people to jump through um i like to think i would do it but i probably wouldn't yeah, man, I, I wouldn't do that. It's like that, that if the if I had to do that in a movie, the guy that wanted to, you'd have been like, yeah, man, here's your fifteen minutes right here. Absolutely, but flipping this table, not the case. So I got, you know, kind of down on my knees, and we were going to do it, and we had to do it in one shot because you don't want to reset all those dishes and food and everything. Uh, and Adam was running the camera, and he was doing it at high speed, so it would be real slow when he when it actually happened. So I felt good, like Adam is manning the camera. Right. So I know it's gonna get captured the way he wants it to be captured. So all I gotta do is my part in it. Now, did that make you more nervous knowing that if you blew it, they'd have to reset all that stuff up? That would be on my mind. Um, surprisingly, I have become so like determined by the amount of pissed off I was that I went into this like Zen mode. Okay, all right. And I was like so focused on I'm flipping this every table. goddamn plate on that table. Yeah. Come hell or high water, this table was going over. Right. Um, now, I did use a little bit of a sense memory of something in my life that I was really pissed off about. I mixed that together with the stuntman dude. And I got down there, and I, as soon as he called action, you know, I went up, and you had that. There was a slight moment where I felt the weight of the table for a second and went, like, wow, this is heavy. But then right after that, <laughs> wow, this is heavy, yeah. But then right after that, like the table just went up, like all the juice juices were flowing. The table went up and flipped over, and I actually, I actually flipped it all the way over, not just, yeah, they weren't it on its side. It looks badass, man. Yeah. So it flipped all the way over, and then they, the art department loved me because they didn't have to reset that stuff anymore. It was, you know, the food was hidden under the table now, so no continuity issues, you know. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that, that I'm glad you brought up that story because there is, you know, that was an interesting night for me. And I just remember the stunt guy walking over and looking at the table. You know, he didn't want to be too embarrassed by what a douchebag right. he, was, he was acting like. And so he was like, wow. And I'm like, you just back off, dude. I'm going to kick you right in the gooch. <laughs> You're like, I'm full of green tea, and I just flipped that table. Uh, yeah, I know who the guy you're talking about. I don't know if I remember hearing that you couldn't flip the table, but it doesn't surprise me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you know these things. You get these – some stunt guys are great, great guys, but occasionally you get that, like, type A asshole who was, like, the bully in high school. Uh, yeah, better. I mean, he t I, this is the same guy, the individual. He took me outside. And like gave me the the uh, crossbow uh, of yours, but the one that you know, because they were were real weapons. You know, I mean, they were just you know weren't uh, gonna shoot or anything. And 
he was trying to teach me how to shoot a crossbow and seeing it, you know, and all this. And I'm like, dude, when am I ever going to shoot this thing for real? You know, he's like, see if you can hit that tree. And it's like, why? <laughs> why? He's like, is the tension too much, you know, for you to pull back and load that? I'm like, I'm not loading any arrows. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? He's like, so is, is your arm a little too weak to get there? Yeah, right, right, right. Uh, you need a man to show you how to how to cock that bolt. <laughs> right. No. Um, yeah. <laughs> that was a good shoot. Um, so we're going to be at a convention soon. Yes, we are. And I wanted to kind of say this because when I was on the set of Your Next, and the, people were starting to take pictures of me in the outfit, which was i'm sure the same for you on the set and there, i remember a person come up to me and he said so you know this is going to be like a convention thing right and i hadn't really never thought of that i'd never been to a convention or anything like that yeah. and yeah. i thought well that would be cool but i didn't ever actually think that would happen and then lo and behold after the movie comes out um, we'll talk a little bit about the reaction after the movie came out, but after the movie came out, we started doing conventions. I did one and then you started doing them with me. Yeah. Cause I thought it was a sham. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, we had the same convention people, uh, Stacy and Chris, you know, and, uh, we're great. They take great care oh, of us. Oh yeah. They're excellent. Um, so you had done what one in Carolina or somewhere like that. I've done one in Hunt Valley, uh, Maryland. I Maryland, guess. okay. Um, and I had received an email that was like, we're interested in promoting you and managing you and going to conventions. And I'm like, bullshit, nobody's gonna, you know, I thought it was a fraudulent scheme, but uh, then I had talked to you and been like, hey, did you get this email? And you're like, yeah, man, it's great. I've already done one. And I'm like, well, holy hell, you know, because I never thought of it either. Adam had mentioned that to me at one point before any of that had happened like you said that guy on the set did he was like he's like give it a few years man he's like i think you'll be you know people will always remember you as the fox mask killer you know or whatever and i'm just thinking yeah yeah there's no, you know there's you know it's not like i'm you know well i'll say that i was gonna say like jason Voorhees or something but you know that's also um what's the word i'm looking for a uh Come on, LC, don't leave me hanging. Uh, um, sequels, what do you call that? Um, franchise. Franchise. Yeah, we're not so much. We're one off, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would really like to see it go to another film, but I mean, we're all dead, you know. Oh, hell yeah. And there were, uh, and in Simon's show, he actually gave a scenario for a sequel, um, which I thought sounded really cool. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, originally there were ideas. Happen though, I would like to see it happen. Did he say he would like to see it happen? Yeah, he'd say he he said he would like to see it happen. But there was also an idea of doing a graphic novel okay. using this story that he presented to me um, or presented to the audience, really, because he told everybody that watched, um, which was real interesting. But you could take it in many many different directions. I I kind of feel like maybe your next is just going to be remade one day when we're old yeah, and gray. That'd be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of the way I see it. Um, the reaction to the movie when it first came out was actually pretty positive. Um, yeah, absolutely. But the fan uh, interest has built over the years and it is, has kind of become a cult classic. Um, <laughs> you see, I like your, your like work play there. Yeah. Clever. You, yeah. you like that segue? Yeah. Yeah. Because we happen to be, Lane and I, both appearing at a convention next week called the Cult Classic Convention. And it's going to be uh, Friday through Sunday of next week. That's September 28th through the 30th in Bastrop, Texas, right outside of Austin. It's the town where they, where they filmed the original Texas Chainsaw, and they filmed some of the sequel there, too, the first sequel. Well, that's what I'm pumped about is being able to go... You know, yeah. I mean, we've had a good time at all the conventions, you know, sometimes you've got, uh, you know, you always made it, uh, you know, cool, cool people there though. But, uh, you know, there's been some we've been to where like, I feel like we're selling dirty socks and underwear, you know what I mean? You know, mm -hmm. we're like, 
at a flea market and we don't have anything worth a damn and nobody cares, you know, and that, you know, it's fine. And then some we go and we meet hordes of people, but uh, either way this goes, I'm excited about just going there. Oh yeah. 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 And getting to see, getting to see some of those great locations. Uh, some of the people that are there, we we've had, we've done conventions with before. Some of them are, are new. I know that, you know, all the leather faces pretty much are going to be there. Ed Neal yeah. is going to be there. To jump in real quick. You're in a movie with one of those guys coming out, right? Or like you've got a film? Yeah, I'm going to be filming a movie with Bill Johnson, who was Leatherface in, in Texas Chainsaw 2. Uh, and we're actually going to be talking there about it because the director of that movie, Will William uh, Instone, is going to also be there. And as the char as one of the characters that appears in that movie, which is cool. How did that come about for you? I'm curious. Well, uh, like, hey, you know, tell well, me your story. Well, William had contacted me a couple years, two, three years ago, about doing a movie that he was developing called Among the Dead, which was a um, zombie film. And he's actually going to be on the show here pretty soon, and we'll talk more in detail about that then. But that's how we first met. And then over time, that project sort of got bigger and bigger, and then it became maybe a little bit too big to produce at, at the moment. So he turned his attention to uh, kind of a smaller film to be his first as a feature length director. And that's this movie, Butcher's Bluff. Um, it's a really good script. I'm really happy to be in it. I'm already signed to do it. So uh, yeah, we're gonna be doing some promoting of it at the, at the cult classic convention. Cult classic. Yeah, and uh, hopefully we'll. Uh, I'll be a part of making another cult classic. Yes. Here's. Uh, to, um, speaking of new projects, I have a movie coming out. Yes, let's talk about the nobodies. The nobodies. So what's up with the nobodies? How'd that come about? It's directed by our buddy Jay Burleson. Yeah. Yep. Um, he is a fellow Alabamian or whatever. Uh, he lives in the same, grew up and lives in the same small town, Hartzell, that I live in. And uh, we met on the set of, even though we live in the same town, grew up in the exact same, you know, not 10 minutes away from each other. We met in Atlanta on Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, both mm. being extras in Haddonfield, you know, and yeah. big, you know, Halloween fan. And, we met on a uh, extras bus being charted, you know, around, and uh, we've been doing little projects here and there, music, film, photography, and he kind of, he kind of, I guess, I don't know, I can't speak for him, I don't know where the idea, you know, all originated from, but it's another low budget movie. I would say, though, that other than Pop Skull and You're Next, I would say that The Nobodies is, maybe I mean it's in my top three projects I've ever done I mean that I'm proudest of not just for me like performance wise just overall it's uh, more of an art film it it is released by trauma you know so you automatically there's like a certain stigma there where it uh, you know because trauma has a, uh, a reputation you know for certain types of films um, which isn't bad I love trauma I always wanted to have something released by them but uh it's not really your uh typical trauma release you know i'm saying it's an art film but there's yeah. a movie inside a movie called pumpkin and essentially it's about a small town director that is kind of like i guess i would describe as an ed wood of his town you know he wants to make these movies and they're very uh, bad you know, but he has this whole belief that he's going to be, you know, a uh, Kurt Cobain of film kind of, you know. And uh, so it's a fake documentary about uh, this guy trying to make these movies. And, and then it has clips of his films that we made, you know, mm -hmm. inside of it. And, uh, you know, it's really good, man. Uh, I don't know what else to really say about it. It comes out, what did I tell you, the 6th of October? Yeah. 
right? It comes out the six. You can pre-order it now. It comes out the six, and you can watch it now on Troma now. That's right. There's yeah. a lot of now. There's a lot of nows in that. <laughs> there's they have Troma has a VOD, and you can go there and you can stream it. Um, and actually, if you look in the link of this YouTube video, I've put the uh, place where you can go watch it on Troma now. The nobodies. Ian probably read a description a little better than the one I gave to, written by a professional individual. Um, yeah, I read it, and it sounded really good. It is good. It's cool. Uh, I know Jay wants wants to do something with you in it, probably pretty soon, sooner than than later. But um, wink, wink. Uh, <laughs> but um, I'm all I'm all about it, man. I like I like Jay very much. We've talked uh, quite a bit. Oh yeah, he's a really, really talented. I mean, but uh, yeah, the nobodies, man. I, I can't say much more about it really because it would spoil a lot of the where the film goes. But uh, it's uh, it's something else, man. Yeah, I mean, when we showed it at Sidewalk, we had a you know uh, a sold out, it sold out, you know, and we had a pretty good venue at Sidewalk, and within like the first fifteen minutes people are like walking out you know because of the content with inside the fake film because they you know they didn't give it a chance to like marinate and get to like the more artistic you know like oh this has got some substance about it you know but uh already i'm intrigued yeah man it's good if you like uh Cassavetes, john waters you know anything like that you know it's kind of a combination of the two in a weird way yeah well, you know, I'm a fan of, of both. You know what I think about John Cassavetes. He was oh, yeah. right. Yeah, uh, definitely, definitely a hero of mine. This uh, broadcast should just be called Cassavetes. This, yeah, should, this episode number and then title. Um, yeah. yeah. So just take my name out of it. Um, <laughs> but uh, you'll get more traffic with John Cassavetes. Um, yeah, man, I'm excited about it. Um, now, are you going to bring a copy for me to watch? Oh, yeah. I'm going to have uh, some material there to pass out and uh, to get to try to boost pre-orders and all that good stuff or just, you know, uh, promote it in general. It'll be at the table and probably walk around and hand them out and bother people and all that good stuff. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to bring a copy for sure, man. Yeah, I'll have to bring a copy of my last movie, Spiritus, which yes. that's, that's going to be available to own on DVD at the end of next month. So nice. that it's all we got some some releases coming up pretty immediately, man. Yep, it's good to have uh, a lot going on at one time. Oh yeah, for it's sure. Not stressful at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it, convention time, man. It's always a, a lot of fun because you get to meet people, you get to promote stuff like this. You get, of course, you get to talk about the past work, which they they like and admire and everything. Oh yeah. You were talking about the fan reaction, you know, when we did the first one we did together was horror hound, you know? And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, people would have like the three killers like tattooed on their legs and just all this, you know, and it really, it, I mean, I think it's the, the coolest thing, but it really, uh, you know, it was surprising because it's like, oh, wow. You know, you know, I remember talking to Stacy and being like, does anybody even care to meet us? I mean, you know, it's a waste of time. It's like, oh, no, people have tattoos of the killers and, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I got to see some of those tattoos. I signed one of them. Did you? So I guess my signature is tattooed on somebody. Oh, that'd be cool. Do you That's remember when we were at Horror Hound and that that is a crazy, huge convention. Yes. There, the hotel where we were staying in, in Cincinnati, Ohio, had a water park on the first floor. Now, I'm talking an indoor fucking water park. Yes. And this was not a pool with a slide. This was a pool <laughs> with a slide that started on the third floor and went outside it the building. Merry go around in the water. You know, I mean, it was a scene. No, not for real, but I mean, it was pretty elaborate and it had like an arcade. I mean, it was it was wild. Yeah, man. You remember being yeah. in the elevator with Bruce Willis? Oh, uh, not Bruce Willis. So that'd be even crazier. Uh, Bruce Campbell. Yeah, we were on the elevator with Bruce Campbell, and that. Which one of us should tell that story? Well, you can tell it. <laughs> okay. Well, I, mean, I thought we were going to get to see some like down home theatrics, is what we were told. You know, yeah. because he looked like they said that he. 
Well, first of all, our, our elevator, I'll, I'll start it. You can finish. Our elevator broke down or the way we were supposed to get to somewhere, you know, special or whatever. And, uh, so we all had to go, you know, another way. And, uh, they were expecting him not to be too pleased about that. But instead he was like, Hey guys, I know my way around here. And then he just started leading everybody, you know, and it's like all these corridors and stuff and everything. Yeah, the way you got around, the way we got around uh, at, at Horror Hound was because there were so many people packing the convention area. They would take us, and it was like that scene in Goodfellas where you just sort of are going through kitchens and like. Yeah, it was weird. Yeah, you would walk through like a strange uh, secret passageway, and then you'd be in the kitchen, and then there's like these guys preparing meals, and then you're like, what? Where am I? And then you'd being up that it was crazy and i was just curious sometimes they're like you know it's literally the guys in the chef's coats and the hats and yeah. fucking steam coming out of pots and <laughs> yeah. you, would, you would turn around and you'd just see like bruce campbell in a bright neon yellow sports jacket leading a group of actors through your territory like and then in, into a room and downstairs and and right. then eventually we got into an elevator. <laughs> I remember there was some controversy about whether or not you were allowed to ride the elevator with Bruce Campbell, but he seemed to have no problem with everyone riding the elevator with him that time. Right. Now, I had had an earlier experience with Bruce Campbell involving an elevator, um, uh, which I, I don't know if I'll go into. <laughs> okay. But yeah, um, he is a trip, that Bruce Campbell. So you became kind of, uh, uh, maybe friends isn't the right word, but uh, a guy that we've done quite a few of these with, Doug Bradley, right? Yeah, I'm friends with Doug, yeah. That dude, I don't like talking to him only because he he's very, you know how you know a lot of people when they talk to you, they're just looking for the next person to speak to. So they're not looking at you, they're looking over your shoulder. He like looks you dead in the eyes. And I'm just like, stop staring at me. You know what I mean? It's like a, an unnerving thing for me because he's just like really attentive and he's listening, but it's just like he doesn't break a, a stare at all. And you're like, hmm. But you guys yeah. get along. I mean, yeah, I, I seen, uh, he wrote that book though, right? That Men Behind the Mask thing. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because I actually, if I can grab it without going off camera, I have it right here. That's his book. Yeah. Behind the Mask of the Horror Actor by Doug Bradley with a forward whoop, by Clive with, Barker. Clive Barker. Yeah. It's actually a really good book. He interviews Kane Hodder and uh, Robert England and just a bunch of. Would you ever want to do other characters that are, you know, masked or, you know, what I mean, that aren't the, the lamb killer? You know, would you ever want to, would you be okay yourself with playing more of those, you know, or would you? say oh, I've done that you know I would do it as long as it wasn't derivative or it's like a straight rip off of the of the lamb right you know I mean if it's the same thing I'd rather just do a year next sequel right um, but I can't say I wouldn't just all together it would have to be something really different though you know so it's not just like you're repeating yourself in a mask right I can yeah. see that yeah but um but yeah, man, I guess we're getting to a point where we should start wrapping it up. Um, I have to get ready to go to my real job. <laughs> All right. But let me go ahead and mention again everything that we yes. are doing. Uh, let's start with the nobodies. Comes out for you to own on DVD, Blu-ray, all that good stuff on October the 6th. You can pre-order it now at Trauma. If you go to the YouTube description beneath this video, you can actually watch it at Troma now. So that's The Nobodies. That's Lane's new movie. Um, next week, Friday through Sunday, Lane and I are going to be appearing at the Cult Classic Convention, the Cult Classic Convention, at Bastrop, Texas. That's, um, yeah, September 28th through the 30th. So come on out, meet us, meet my friend Damian Maffei, meet Jason Baldwin, Edwin Neal. Oh, that's so uh, crazy. Jason Bill, Baldwin. Yeah, Bill Johnson is going to be there, Dan Yeager, a bunch of horror uh, uh, music, bands, and, and shit. You're going to love it, right? That's the cult classic convention. So if you're near Austin, Texas, come meet us next thir next Friday through Sunday. And I think that's about everything that we need to promote. Did I miss anything, Lane? You have a movie coming out at the end of October. 
Oh, so, yes. Yeah, I should go ahead and promote that, too. My film that I wrote and directed called Spiritus comes out at the uh, near the end of October. The exact date, we're not quite sure. It's going to be around Halloween. Those of you who pre-ordered it will, of course, get it before then. And then after that, it will be available to every, for everyone else to own on, on DVD. Um, so, yeah, I think that about wraps everything up. Um, well, it was a pleasure. I look forward to seeing you in at the Cult Classic. Yes, and I, the it. same, the same for me, man. I, I really appreciate you coming on the show, and like I said, we could talk forever as much as we. Oh, yeah, man, it can go on forever. I mean, we didn't get to get any to any fun shit though, like everybody else. Like, got to talk about like conspiracy theories. I mean, we could easily spend an hour on JFK alone. I mean. Yeah, we'll have to do. We'll, we're we're going to do more of these, Lane. I think. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we could do a whole show just about our convention experiences. Yeah, that would probably, for sure. There's that been <laughs> probably interesting because I have a couple stories that, that actually popped in my mind when we were talking about conventions. But Me too. that would be a whole. The guy that uh, did uh, what was it? Garfield. Uh, no, uh, he did Charlie Brown. Yeah, that guy. Yeah, he's a, he's another uh, good friend of mine. He is quite a character. Yes, he is. Uh, we're gonna we'll get into that though on on another show. <laughs> yeah, all right. But um, but for now, I guess we're gonna have to say goodbye to everybody. Uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. All kinds of cool interviews coming up. Again, Lane, thanks for being here. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, we you want to do one from uh, the convention? I guess maybe. Man, I wish we could if we can figure out how to do it. Uh, we might be able to do that. Yeah. Um, let me think it over. We'll see what we I'm can sure work out. Build some kid's laptop and what? Yeah. I'm I'll just commandeer yeah. some. Hey, you, yes. come here. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You. Yeah. You with the right. chainsaw. I'll trade, I'll trade autographs for things we need. Yeah. I'm going to broadcast from your phone. Come here, bastard. <laughs> right. But uh, anyway, uh, thank you guys for watching. Again, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you next time. Thanks.